Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I know there's lots of great talks on specifically in this time slot. Um, so today we're going to talk about how you can simplify the admin experience in Drupal to really make it easy for the people who use it most. You think about a content heavy website, typically it's actually your content authors and editors who are spending way more time on the site than even sort of your, your vi visitors that, uh, that come to ingest that same content. So. My name is Martin Anderson Klutz. I work at Acquia on Drupal.org and a bunch of other social platforms. I go by Manclu. I've done a bunch of sort of Drupal and related certifications, but uh, probably more relevant to today. I'm also UX set, uh, certified by the Nielsen Norman Group. So um, Drupal does have a reputation of being hard to learn. And I can verify that because a big part of my job is basically selling Drupal to people who are trying to decide what CMS is, is going to be best for them. But the good news is that we have the power to make it easier. So as we go through this, we're going to be talking about some ideas in terms of how you can make Drupal easier for those um, authors and editors. Sometimes it'll involve like contrib modules. Sometimes it's just a simple matter of configuration in terms of really thinking about the experience that you're actually creating for those people. So um, this book is written by one of the founders of the Nielsen Norman Group, Don Norman. I mean, yeah, this book really talks about this idea of developing the skill of observations. So sort of trying to see through things as they are to think about like, is that actually a good experience or can we maybe think about a, a, a new way of trying to solve that same problem that's going to make it easier for the user. And also this, you know, on the topic of usability, these uh, really interesting series of videos, it's part of the Epicurious channel, but it's called Well Equipped. And uh, this Dan Formosa, who's actually a usability expert, looks at different kinds of gadgets. And uh, part of each video is he'll actually do a usability test, which is really interesting. And so what he actually does is he'll, uh, he's right-handed, but he'll use his left hand. And he'll actually cover it in vegetable oil to sort of like make it as difficult as possible to get a sense of like, you know, what are the chances that somebody's going to try to use this thing and just outright fail. And so I thought it would be interesting for our talk today to try and do a little bit of that um, and look at, at the Drupal editorial experience through a bit of that same lens now. If we wanted to go you know, harder down that path, we could do things like change the language to something that I wouldn't recognize, like you know, Greek or even a right to left language, so that even like the placement of things is different and really rely on strong visual cues. But for today, um, I'm just going to sort of role play the idea of somebody who's really new to Drupal. So uh, going to log in here as an editor. And the first thing that I'm brought to you is this admin page. And as a content creator, what do you think is the next thing that I'm going to do from here? So, right, exactly. There, for a lot of sites, this user page is really not a useful destination, right? There's, there's no queue in terms of where to go next, any of those things. So as a user, I'm, you know, the clearest call to action I have is this link to the home page. So let's go here. And then once we're here, if I start to scroll down, eventually I see that there's a link here to create content so we can go there. And in this case, I want to create an event because my site builder has set up this event content type. And let's go ahead and start the process of creating our demo content. So we can grab some lorem ipsum to got, drop in there as our body copy. We can start to populate a date on when this is going to happen. So we'll say it's going to be next Monday at 11 AM. And you can see I have to populate a bunch of different fields to get this date set and then do the process again for when it's going to end, which again is a lot of input to ask of the user. Uh, I'm going to go here and set the event type. So let's say it's going to be a webinar. And now I get to um, put in a location. So let's say it's going to be at our Toronto office, but it's not in the database. I know that I actually need to go and create that. So as a user, um, I might not know how to create the, um, the location content, but I did, in the process of clicking here, see that it's uh, listed here. So I'm going to go back and go into the location. But guess what I've just done? I've lost all of the work that I did in, in populating that because I had to go back out in order to get here to, to create the uh, location. 
So now I could start to say, you know, um, Toronto office. Um, and now I go to populate the country, and I've got this whole list of countries because the site builder has basically just dumped in an address field. And so I've got to scroll all the way through to find the US. And then it's got first name and last name left as required fields. Um, you know, same thing with the state here. So you can see there are a lot of what, very simple things that could have been done to make this whole experience better. So um, let's start to talk about what are some ideas that we could bring to creating this kind of an admin experience that's going to be easier to use. So uh, Steve Krug is a great author who's written a lot about web usability. Uh, Don't Make Me Think is, you know, not a very large book. It's an easy one to get through, but it has a lot of really good ideas around really trying to make every, you know, every page, every task within your website self-evident or at least self-explanatory. So if there's something complicated about it, give them enough, you know, visual cues, prompts, even just, you know, documentation so that on the page they can figure it out without hopefully having to refer to some outside reference. Um, on top of that, you know, standard UX principles, so, you know, trying to establish a, a visual hierarchy, you know, consistent use of colors, especially for things like links. Um, but let's dive into some more specifics in terms of how that can apply to our uh, Drupal admin experience. So when you're creating fields on your content types, provide help text. You know, the field is there. It's very simple. You just have to, you know, um, expend the, um, the time to, to write those in a way that's going to sort of help give some context in terms of what expectation or what the expected content is going to be. Um, if you have icons that you're using on your site, um, provide labels at least on Hover. Um, you know, I think uh, Jacob Nielsen used to talk about like a mystery meet interface as being something that's like just a bunch of icons and people have to sort of guess as to what they're all going to do. Um, the other thing is we've all been on those websites where they ask you for a password um, and then you, you um, give the password twice and then submit it and then it says, oh no, there were a bunch of rules that we never told you about and now you've got to like make up a new password to, to fit all these rules. So don't be that site. Uh, if there are expectations or validation constraints, like state those up front so that people can get it right the first time. Um, in terms of the language that you use on your site, you know, really try and avoid the Drupalism. So don't call things like nodes and entity and media. Try to call them by very concrete, um, you know, relatable terms. So alerts, events, images, like make them specific to the thing that, that people are working on. Um, complexity is, a, is an interesting one because Typically, a site is going to have different kinds of users, and so you really want to be able to leverage the sort of like excellent role-based access control system in Drupal to really provide appropriately complex roles for um, each of those different kinds of users. So a content creator might want something that's just like, let me go in, get some content created, and then move on with my day. Editors might need more complexity because they're starting to like manage workflow and maybe do some like testing tools, those kinds of things. And then the site admin obviously is going to have access to everything. And so like each of those roles needs a different level of complexity based on the kinds of things that they're trying to do in the site. Um, the thing to, to understand too is that the right answer for each of those roles is going to be different from site to site and can also change over time. So you might want to keep the experience very, very simple when you're onboarding a set of users to a new site that's just launched. Um, but then as they become sort of familiar with those tools and start to master them, then you, you can start to add some additional capabilities if there are, are new things that they want to be able to do. Um, also look at you know, ways to reduce friction. So we saw in the, the demo that we just did about having to sort of do multiple clicks to get to you know, just that page for creating a page. So things like admin toolbar, obviously will make that much easier. Um, the coffee module is a really nice one. Um, what's up? What does the coffee module do? Coffee module basically gives you like a search. It's almost like Silverlight on a Mac. So you do like, I think it's uh, control D and it'll bring up like a search bar in your thing and then you can just uh, start typing which, wh what page you want to get to. So it's not like necessarily super intuitive, but once people get the hang of it, it, it makes it very fast to get where you're trying to go. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, another one that I really like is this login and logout redirect parole. I think there's a couple of modules that are roughly equivalent, but the idea being that like, as soon, as soon as somebody logs in, you can specify where they're going to be taken. So a content creator, maybe you take them directly to like the content dashboard 
or um, content editor goes to some kind of like a moderation dashboard. Um, maybe the admin user you take to like the status page or recently logged errors, but like really try and think about for each of those roles, what's going to be a useful place for them to start as opposed to, again, that user page. Um, I like to think about a website as kind of being made up almost as of uh, systems, so like an event system. Um, you know, the, you can think of like a, um, a staff directory as a system for people, or like a, a locations page as a system for managing, you know, those that location data. And so, as much as possible, I think if you can keep people in that context of the system that they're in, uh, to try and do things like, you know, managing the data there, it becomes more intuitive because they don't have to remember, like, I'm going to go off to this other place to manage the data and then come back to sort of validate that it looks the way I expected. So, um, so for simple tasks, try and keep them directly in there. Uh, but for more complex tags, like Drupal has the like destination parameter that you can use to sort of bring them back after they've they've done something. And we'll we'll see an example of that in a minute. Um, these are a couple of modules. Again, we're going to demo these uh, actually in just a second. Um, but really help that process in terms of of making it easy to add these kinds of links. So as an example, this is the Quick, Quick Links module. Uh, which basically makes it really easy to add uh, SVG icons to the top of your home page. And uh, the other thing that it does out, out of the box is it provides for administrators these, uh, these two sort of default links that uh, make it super easy to manage. So, excuse me, if I was to click on the add link, it's going to open up the uh, settings tray. So again, directly on the home page, I haven't gone to another page at all. It's going to give me the option here to add in, you know, the label that should appear on there, choose an icon out of the media library. I can um, obviously specify where it needs to point to and then optionally add some hover text. Now, if I was doing this for a customer, I'd probably like play around a little bit with the text, maybe have that in like a collapsible element so that more of it could be together. But you get the general idea in terms of sort of keeping them in context. Similar thing with the manage links, in this case using uh, draggable views. So again, without uh, having to leave the home page, they can add and remove links. Uh, they can specify the order, do all of those things uh, directly on the home page. Um, also really valuable to your um, you know, editors and content authors if you can provide immediate feedback directly within the site. So instead of having to rely on like a, a site improve to like do you know, whatever weekly or monthly crawls and then give them a long report and then having to sort of like work their way through all of that feedback, as they're creating content, a tool like Editorially can tell them, are there accessibility issues in that content? You can use responsive preview as a way for them to, to look at that in different mobile devices. And then a tool like uh, Yoast SEO can give them feedback on, is it sort of keyword optimized? And one thing I like to do that you know, doesn't require any module, again, simple configuration, is let's say on your articles you're, you have a very wide format that you're using to display images. Um, in the form where people are going to basically pick that um, image out of the media library, just use a smaller version that has the same proportions as basically the preview. And then that way, after people have picked the image, that author is going to see exactly what that cropping looks like for the image before they even save the content. So they may like pick it and go, oh, actually cropped to that proportion. That image doesn't look that great. So I'm going to go pick another one, again, without having to like save it see it, and then go back in. So um, just small things. A lot of these little things, I feel like in aggregate, uh, kind of make the experience much better. So let's also talk about some sort of principles specifically around how to configure your forms. So uh, for field usability, you definitely want to clearly mark required fields. Fortunately, Drupal does a pretty good job of that out of the box. Um, where you can, provide sensible defaults. So you know we saw before our event type. If 90% of the time that's going to be a webinar, then just set that as a default. And then when people hit that edge case, they can change it. Um, placeholder text is actually kind of a usability uh, gremlin because um, people kind of fell in love with uh, placeholder text for a while. But the problem is, if you're using that as like your field label or your descriptive text, the minute you start to put any, um, any actual data in there, your placeholder text is gone. So if that's important information in terms of like, you know, what's the structure of the data that has to go in there, you know, I put in one character and now I've lost all of that guidance. Um, so make that an actual like field description that's always going to be visible. Um, 
if your, your form has to have more than one action button, clearly visually indicate sort of which one is the primary one. And uh, sometimes people say that they want, like especially customers, like a clear or reset button out of form. But it's almost always a source of confusion for your users, so push back and, and basically tell them. Um, usability studies say no. Um, from a field standpoint, if you can use sort of uh, radios or checkboxes instead of select elements is going to be more usable because coming to the form as an author, I can immediately see what all the choices are. Um, if you have a lot of them, it's not, I've seen some guidance that says more than five, but you can sort of figure out what, what you think is best for your own site. Um, that's when, when it may make more sense to go to a select, but you can use like a select two or a chosen so that you actually have like a search on that element as well. So um, just again, small things to, to make that experience easier. Um, and then also you may have elements that, that aren't even needed. So things like promote to front and sticky. Um, if, if those don't actually do anything for your, the content architecture, then, then just hide them in the form. Uh, the simplify module can allow you to hide some other fields. And uh, field permissions is also another one. So if there are certain fields that really only administrators need to use, then use field permissions to hide them except for the people that actually need to use them. Um, for reference fields, there are a couple of modules that can help. So inline entity form allows people to sort of create those um, reference data structures if they don't exist, and we're going to sort of um, see that in a minute. And there's also this module called Tagify, that you can sort of see in the demo here, um, which actually provides kind of a nice UI for sort of managing tags. Um, it's a little bit nicer than the autocomplete, drag and drop, and, and some other nice things. Uh, so the other founder of the Nielsen Norman Group is this man, Jacob Nielsen. Um, he famously said, users spend most of their time on other websites that means that users prefer your site to work the same way as all the other sites they already know. So occasionally it's tempting to sort of like invent some fancy new way of, of doing a common thing, but oftentimes actually the admins would rather that you follow the existing patterns so that they don't have to sort of like learn your sort of like weird and new way of doing things. Um, so oftentimes as you're starting to think about these interfaces, like think about if there are existing models that you can leverage to make the process easier for people. So, you know, if you're doing a calendar, then, then maybe try and use a widget that's closer to the way like Google Calendar works or something, something similar. Um, and a simple example, so um, late last year, made this module called Key Save. Key save. So um, makes your web forms act a little bit more like an application in the sense if you do like Control S or Command S, it'll actually save the entity form as opposed to like trying to save the, the web page to your uh, desktop, which is almost never what people actually want. Um, and on that note, there, there can be sort of like specialized fields that, that help you to sort of replicate those existing uh, mental models that people may have. So uh, the address module has, you know, kind of a nice layout and, and a way of managing address fields. Uh, Smart date is really meant, again, to sort of mimic um, popular calendar software, um, can even help to manage recurring events. Um, and in terms of how you organize your form, like, again, try and think about what's a logical hierarchy. So. Um, you definitely want to have the most important fields towards the top, um, probably required fields, you know, obviously count among those. Um, it, sometimes it can be helpful to sort of uh, visually group related fields and labels. So if there's like a bunch of fields that are really just metadata, maybe related to search or something, group those all together so that there's some like logic when people look, look at the form. And it may be tempting sometimes to sort of try and like have things side by side to sort of make the, the form seem more compact, but uh, usability studies show that people actually prefer to work top to bottom and not have to sort of like sometimes go down and sometimes across and, and sort of, um, you know, follow different patterns. Um, from a consistency standpoint, it can be helpful to have the edit form sort of follow the same structure as the actual display side. So it's like if they know I need to go in and edit this field, and there's sort of a similar layout on the edit side, then it can sort of help in terms of being able to find that quickly. Um, and also, if you're using the same you know, widgets or managing the same kinds of data across different content types, if you can sort of like um, name those and, and have them manage those in the same way across, as opposed to each one feeling like new and different from each other, then, then that can also help as well. Um, and also think about if there's sort of a more typical use case. So uh, we talked about this a little bit in terms of like setting a default, but um, if there are a bunch of fields that are really more around handling very specialized uh, use cases, 
maybe put those into like a you know collapsed field set or a tab or something so that you know when you need to use those you can go get those but most of the time it's a it's a cleaner more simple interface excuse me the same thing with uh, WYSIWYG so definitely you can have um, you know as you go through um, building out a site and you know there's one piece of content where we need scientific notation and you know two pages where we need to do complex tables um, you can start to sort of junk up your your WYSIWYG toolbar um, what I would suggest is really kind of put those into some kind of an alternate so maybe default to basic HTML and then put those more into the full HTML and, and give people the ability to switch into that when they need those but most of the time keep it as simple as possible and uh, there's a module called form mode control that can also help in terms of basically having uh, different configuration form configurations for the same like con content type so that um, in cases where they just need to create something quickly you can have a really simple form um, but then when they need to do more like uh, you know more complex editing of like metadata and those kinds of things they can go to the other form so uh, that can help as well also in terms of handling different errors um, you know, we all would like to imagine that we've made our sites like so easy to use that people are never going to like submit and see an error, but obviously that's not going to happen. So uh, make sure that the um, alerts are going to be descriptive enough so that people actually understand what it is that they have to go back and fix. Um, <clears throat> uh, apparently some sites have followed this uh, model of actually putting the errors into like a modal or a pop-up over top of the actual fields where the error happens. And uh, from a usability standpoint, that's kind of a disaster because then you have to dismiss the modal to actually go change the value and now you, don't rem you have to remember what it was that you actually have to fix. So definitely you know, keep those on the same page and even go to like inline form errors where it'll have you know, um, in line with the field element what the, what the error is and, and how to fix it. All right, uh, so all that being said, I uh, thought it would be useful to now look at a demo site that uh, fixes those, but I do have to sort of quickly switch to a different site. So. Just give a second for DDA to spin up. The site is actually hired after my own personal blog site because as I was starting to like build out a site that had some of these ideas built in, I realized that like I like to be lazy in terms of like how I use Drupal myself. So I've actually tried to build in a bunch of these ideas uh, in my own site. So when we land on the home page, we can see that there are buttons here across the top to add the different kinds of content that are listed. Um, same thing over here on the side, if I wanted to add, like I've got a database of modules on my site, so I can um, click there to, to add the form again directly on the page. Um, but if we go through the same process that we started with to add an event, now if we go in and we say this is our demo event, uh, we've got again, so this is the smart date widget where we can go and say um, do that, change the start time to 11 a.m. and really by providing just those three you know data points now we've got our, our time set uh, same thing with the location so we could do a search the same way but if we knew that we had to create a new one we can create that now in line uh, we can also do things like um, set the default country to like you know if we know it's going to be mostly addresses in the US set that as the default you can also restrict that down so if there are only certain countries again make it nice and simple for the editors so that they don't have to sort of scroll through that giant list same thing with the state if this is like you know the florida tourism website then then set florida as the default um, again these are just very simple things that you can do to, to make the process uh, more intuitive for your users um, and then the same thing down here so we actually have this um, Tagify, so you can sort of see how that works. Um, 
goes down, you can drag and drop to reorder those if you want, um, all of those good things. And again, setting uh, sensible defaults wherever they apply. So if there's other pieces that people want to see towards the end, we should have time for questions. A couple of other things I wanted to talk about quickly. So dynamic layouts, I'm not going to go uh, a whole lot in here, but I would say from, at least in my experience, most of the time, um, where it's needed on a website, provide it as sparingly as possible. So usually in the sites that I've tended to work on, there will be like a, um, a landing page content type and then a lot of the other content types are more structured or maybe like the article will have sort of just your WYSIWYG. Um, so it's sort of a mixture of like, um, you know, more free form, like uh, giving editors the ability to sort of actually customize the layout. Um, Definitely all of those, but um, it's it's rare when you actually need to give that layout control to to every content type on at least on sites that I've worked on. But yeah, there, there's always going to be outliers there. So uh, layout builder obviously the benefit is that it's in core. Um, I've listed a couple of modules here that can help in terms of uh, making it easier to manage. I think there was a blog post recently that listed out like 43 modules in the layout builder ecosystem. So definitely use that as a better reference than this one. Um, but you know, there's lots of good options out there in terms of making that experience better. Uh, paragraphs is another popular one. Sorry, go ahead. Do you think that content editors struggle with layout builders? Uh, I think, like a lot of things in Drupal, it probably depends on, on how it's been implemented. I've seen some really gorgeous implementations of layout builder that, um, that are extremely sort of slick and powerful. Um, I know on some of the projects that I've worked on, um, it's, it's sometimes tricky to get the balance right of having sort of like a smaller set of blocks that are configurable to like make it very flexible to do lots of different things. But sometimes uh, editors want something that's very like explicit. So, you know, like image on the left and copy on the right as opposed to like a single one where you can sort of like toggle the layout or something, right? So, so you're saying trying to limit their options but give them like two or three choices? Uh, what I'm saying is you want to talk to the people that you're building it for because um, people who are more technically savvy will want the configurable version, but, but there are some people who just want to be able to say, I want that, um, and then drag that in, and it's sort of like pre-configured. So what I see it is people making a mess of their WYSIWYG. Oh. Um, and then I'd like to be able to give them, you know, lab. Yeah. Yeah, well, par paragraphs is definitely another one. There's layout paragraphs now that you know a lot of people like. I haven't really played around with that much myself. I've used uh, Site Studio myself because I, you know, shill for Acquia. Um, but um, yeah, there's there's lots of good options. Like yeah, we was talking over lunch about you know Bricks is a thing I used a few years back. So you know there's there's lots of options out there. Um, I'm not necessarily like you know putting money on like one over the other, but. Um, I think it, a, a lot of it has to sort of come out of discovery and understanding like technical constraints and you know who you're building it for and, and a bunch of those other things. But I agree that like um, layout builder can be very effective, but um, I think it, it has to be well designed and also probably have good documentation in terms of like how they can use it. So that's what I would say. Um, all right. A few additional thoughts before we close off and, and open it up for questions. Um, some people in my experience find it easier instead of building something out from scratch to take an existing piece of content and say I want to clone that and then make a few changes so that it's like basically you know patterned off of an existing one. So entity clone can be really useful for that. Um, being able to provide sort of a comprehensive dashboard can be really useful. There are a few that you can use. Um, content Planner is actually pretty slick because not only does it give you a content dashboard that you can even do things like have Google Analytics widgets in there and um, you know a few other interesting things, um, but it can also basically provide your content moderation workflows like a Kanban board, um, which is pretty cool. You can have an actual calendar view where you like click on a date and then when you create that piece of content, it's, it's automatically scheduled to go live on that date. So um, there's a lot of interesting things in that content planner, but um, if all you need is a dashboard, it may be overkill, but you know, again, uh, maybe do some research and figure out what's, what's the exact best solution for your particular needs. Um, documentation we sort of touched on already. Um, obviously, standard sort of like uh, writing rules apply, especially for the web. 
make it scannable, uh, steps clearly indicated, um, you know, numbered if possible, if it needs to be done in a sequential way. Um, if you can include screen captures, the more the better. Um, think about the users who are going to use it and like what format is going to work best for them. So I've definitely worked with a bunch of companies that um, can't use Google Docs, so don't say like, here's your Google Docs documentation and then, you know, they're like, well, that's great, but we can't access it. So in that case, you know, save it into Word or provide a PDF, um, those kinds of things. Um, I've also worked with uh, some teams who use uh, Loom as a way to sort of like record short videos of here's how you do X in the browser and that can be really effective as sort of like a very visual walkthrough. Um, and then built into Drupal core are tour and help topics, which can be really effective to sort of have that documentation directly within the website so people aren't even having to go out to like an outside system. Uh, that can be really, really effective as well. Uh, so the last main thing to, to touch on is really about testing. So as much feedback as you can get and as early as, as you can get it, the better. Um, you know, I, I always say like the earlier you can course correct, the cheaper and easier it's going to be. Um, Testing also doesn't have to be expensive, so this book, uh, again by Steve Krug, Rocket Surgery Made Easy, is really about a more sort of like ad hoc, informal testing methodology that means like you don't have to have like a formal lab and like pay people to show up. It's, it's about sort of like grabbing team members from other departments and sitting them in front of something so they're seeing it for the first time and just sort of, you know, getting their reaction as they, as they see it. Um, and really, by, by doing that testing, it allows you to make incremental improvements over time. So again, test as much as possible, get feedback and iterate. Um, I like to say, you know, eat your own dog food. There's really no, to me, there's no replacement for actually getting your developers, give them some sample data, and actually force them to, like, do the data entry. So, like, the Smart Date module is really uh, inspired by doing a bunch of data entry and really seeing, like, just how laborious that was and it was like why is that so much easier in Google Calendar and so like that's where you start to get ideas of like how can we make that better and uh, and sort of help along that innovation cycle. So uh, here's a list of additional resources if you want to sort of dive even deeper into that topic um, but with that uh, I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> this one? Um, I will post these slides to SlideShare later, and if I can, I'll add the link to, um, to the actual session listing. Um, but if not, I'll have it on Twitter as well. So. What model did you yeah. add to allow for the menu editing, like the page like that from, from uh, uh, the settings track? Uh, OK, so go back. Uh, there we go. So um, the the settings tray is like built in the core. Right. So actually, if we go, let's go here. The these links are provided by. Um, so these ones are actually add content by bundle, and it basically has a setting where you can say where do you want it to um, to take the user to fill out that form. So. I have this one, which is again that sort of like using the uh, form mode control to say this is a, a, a shorter form. So if it's like I've just had a talk accepted and I just want to like get it into the database, I can go here and it'll open up in the settings tray. But if it's like oh I forgot to add this one and now it's like you know the recording is up and I've got slides to post and a bunch of other stuff, then I can go here. Oh I've still got it configured, but uh, some of these I think if I go back to the home page. You can set those. Yeah, so it's a toggle. You can have them open up a modal settings tray or as a separate page. So if I go, I think, article. And the link one was the one that I was interested in. Yeah, so this one opens up on its uh, own page. The other thing I forgot to mention before, one of the things I really like about the Gin Admin theme is this little toggle here where you can sort of like toggle that sidebar open and closed, which I feel like, again, for a lot of content creators, it's like so nice to just like, they don't need to see, um, you know, that stuff most of the time. So. Uh, being able to just hide that with a simple click is really slick. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Another model suggestion uh, for the Wizwig is a lot of formats, which kind of removes all the formats you don't want to use when you use for that field. Yeah. So there's there's actually two allowed formats and better formats. Um, but actually, in 10.1, the ability to sort of like per bundle choose which formats are going to be available will be in core. So per bundle or per field. Um, sorry, per field. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Chuck. I noticed that you 
we talked about entity cloning, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is that is that something that you recommend, like pretty widely for use, or is it? Because I've, I've I've run into instances where it's been kind of buggy, and I, I think those were mostly with like paragraphs e-commerce sites in my past. But like, I just wonder, like, if you've had weird kind of weirdness with that. Uh, so I'll say that for me, the part that I like about Entity Clone the least is that when you when you go to do it, if you've got any sort of like uh, reference fields, it'll ask you if you want to like um, to maintain those references or to like basically clone the, the referenced entities. Um, and so I feel like if I was a novice user and I click that, it's like here's this whole screen where it's like ask, making it sound like it's this like huge decision. Yeah. Um, whereas I thought I was doing a really simple thing. So um, I feel like if you could sort of almost say like, you know, just never uh, clone the reference entities and like, you know, maintain those or something, like maybe right. that would be better. Um, it's definitely not a perfect solution, but you know, I, I feel like um, for sites where like it has a very complex structure sometimes, that's where I've seen people say like, if I could start from, you know, like, cloning that one and then just change the five things that need to be changed, then that would be faster. Right. Um, so uh, definitely not like universal by any means, but yeah, it's case by case. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there are free stickers if anybody wants some. So, you know, in addition to what's at the front. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming to the talk. <laughs>